Do we think for a second that God's waiting for us to get clear about all this to start loving us? For a second. Do we think that God's worried that we're not going to figure this out before the buzzer goes off? <laughs> it's like, a, like, like uh, enlightenment and dementia are in a race to the finish line. <laughs> And you hope the wisdom kicks in before the dementia starts. This is why they say in these traditions, the role of the teacher is there to let you know as lovingly and gently as possible that you're beyond human help. <laughs> because if, you, if it was human help, then it would be a finite strategy that could deliver the infinite. But the finite never delivers the infinite. This is the great dilemma really, that the architect of our heart makes our heart in such a way that nothing less than an infinite union with the infinite will do. That's the setup. That infinite love creates our heart in such a way that nothing less than an infinite union with the infinite will do. But all of our strategies, all of our plans, all our theologies, all of it, all of it, are finite. This is the essence of the dark night for John of the Cross. This is for Teresa in the fourth mansion. The reason's not yet been conquered by love. And uh, so how then, uh, here we are now. Here we are. Okay. We're manifestations of the divine. We're manifestations of the divine. They get lost in the ignorance of the manifestations of the divine. Ignorant that we are the manifestations of the divine. The divine flashes forth in the ignorance of our heart. On a starlit night, uh, the, the presence of the friend, the solitary hour, see, the poem, whatever it is. Dan Walsh used to say at the monastery, I know it, I know it, I know that I know it. The trouble is, it's I who know that I know it. And when I try to tell you what it is that I know that I know, I don't know what to say. And so we, 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 we're, we're confused. We are so confused. But we, we turn a corner, and all of a sudden, confusion ceases. Because in the face of a friend, see, holding a sleeping child in your arms, the smell of a rose, listening to the rain, in the midst of your darkest hour, see, clarity flashes forth. How foolish we are to worry so like this. Not to worry, because the next theme, why? Because no despair of ours can alter the reality of things or stain the joy of the cosmic dance, which is always there. Why? Because it beats in our very blood, whether we want it to or not. There's the extraordinary thing, really. I mean, in one sense, our deepest, out of all the ways that we're powerless, the deepest manifestation of our powerlessness is that we're powerless to be. Yet even though we're powerless to be, we are. See? <clears throat> At the deathbed of a dying friend, it's so clear that our next breath belongs more to God than ourselves. We are powerless to be by virtue of our power to be, but we are. And uh, uh, so here we are. This is our, the mystics are trying to say, this is our situation. And we're all in this together, every one of us. We're all in this together, God's loved children. See, God's precious, fragmented, broken, tragic earth, like this. And here we are. Next theme. Yet the fact remains that we are invited to forget ourselves on purpose. Cast our awful solemnity to the winds and join in the general dance. It's pretty good. The fact remains that we're invited to forget the self that forgets. That is, we are invited to disidentify with our cherished illusions about ourselves in order that we might discover who God eternally knows us to be. Now, 
As Merton says, we're all dopes, but we're all loved dopes. You see? <laughs> so how do we do this? Now this is path talk. This is path talk. If the mystics are inviting us to understand the nature of our situation, there were manifestations of the divine seeking the divine. And we're seeking the divine because we're lost in the ignorance that we are manifestations of the divine. And though lost in the ignorance that we're manifestations of the divine, the divine flashes forth unexpectedly in our ignorance. And it gives rise to a desire. It gives rise to a desire. See, how to live in a daily abiding awareness of the depths so fleetingly glimpsed. There's, there's the desire. Uh, that the lover is not content with fleeting encounters, but seeks to breathe the air the lover breathes and to abide perpetually in the presence of the oneness that sustains us always. How can I learn to become a man or a woman for whom contemplative awareness becomes my habitual awareness of everything that I'm aware of. That's my desire. And uh, I think the mystics share with us out of their own, the intimacy of their own journey. They, they try to help us. They try to help us with this. And so some concluding thoughts on path talk and how, what does it mean to do this? Again, I would suggest you could go through the writings of the mystics, and each one has their own vocabulary for some of these core themes, like the, the tonal quality of the great way of the path. First theme that we find in this path, um, to join in the general dance by forgetting ourselves on purpose. Uh, you know, Thomas Merton talks about the beginning contemplative, uh, sitting in their room uh, before a full-length mirror, on a prayer cushion, posing and posturing, trying to look contemplative. <laughs> <laughs> and so how do we forget the self that forgets the posing and the posturing, and how do we break forth uh, to realize we don't need to pretend because we already are, see, who God eternally loves? How do we, how do we learn to abide in this clarity of mind and heart? First, first thing we find in the mystics, first, you'll find all of them saying this, it's, and these are all things we all know, is uh, love. It holds the key to it all. See. To love God, to love yourself, to love others, to love all things. For it's love that opens our heart to the infinite love that loves us loves others and loves all things into being forever is love. Become a great lover. Become a great lover. And uh, well, what's going on these days in which you find yourself compromising and doing violence to the preciousness of your own heart or to the preciousness of this person or that person to life as it is, is to learn to love. Next thing is to learn to be faithful to some form of silent prayer or wordless meditation, a contemplative sitting. That is, learn to stabilize yourself in love-filled silence. Learn to stabilize yourself in love-filled silence. I fled him down the nights and down the days, down the labyrinth of the years. And we might not learn how to stop running from God, but at least we can slow down enough that God doesn't have to run so fast to catch us. So, you know, we might not be able to make it happen, but at least we can learn with God's grace to learn not to offer so much resistance to it happening, you know, which is our practice. Here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord, just as I am. You know me through and through and through and through and through. See, precious, precious, precious in all this brokenness and limitation like this. <clears throat> Next is to join in the general dance. Then, that through love, 
by being the, in the day by day, in the concreteness of love day by day, and in this practice, this way, we discover ourselves joining in the general dance. I think maybe this way is understanding what meditation is. Meditation practice reduces it down to its simplest terms so that in the rhythm of our breathing, we can begin to join in the general dance of our breathing. The rhythm of the breathing is the rhythm of God, being God in us, as our breathing. And so we join in the general dance of these rhythms of life itself. Here then is a, uh, uh, a concluding uh, image here on this. If we define a dance as any act repeated over and over to a rhythm is a dance, we understand a dance in the most general terms possible, is any movement repeated over and over to a rhythm. And I ask you to imagine that someone is videotaping you this weekend, this week, 24 hours a day. And at the conclusion of this, your time here, we're going to all file in here. There's going to be a large screen TV up here. And the, the 24 hour videotape of you has been edited and set to music. And we're all going to watch you here this week. Set to music. Scary thought. <laughs> and what would we see set to music? It's like we'd see the dance of standing up and sitting down. Like da dun da dun da dun da dun da dun The dance of being alone and being with others. The dance of being excited, you're finally getting it, and then confused, you don't think you ever will. The dance of being virtuous, then not virtuous at all. The dance of being strong and feeling weak, and all of that, and all of that, and all of that. It's, it's the realization that the concrete intimacy of the very rhythms of this dance is the infinite love of God giving itself away is the concrete intimacy of those very rhythms. And God waits for us to find her there. God forever comes to visit, but we're rarely at home. We're probably out buying a spiritual book somewhere. <laughs> So this is my sense of this, really, then. See, we could say that the mystics give us dance lessons, really. The mystics are giving us dance lessons. This, this orchestration of the heart learning to cooperate with the love that is its life. Really. And uh, uh, once we get the flavor of this, that is, once we learn to pick up, it, it can't be grasped in a conclusion, but it can be intuitively recognized in childlike receptive openness to the truth of it. Then trusting the truth of it, the felt sense of the big picture, we can learn to move more freely with it. See, and go ever deeper, 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 uh, forever. Oh, wow, well, I'm done. <laughs> so let's do this. Let's, uh, let's, just, let's stand and stretch in silence for just 30, 40 seconds, and then we'll have like up to 15 minutes of dialogue. How would that be? Then we'll be finished. Okay, so let's stand and stretch in silence. <laughs> it's like bears at the zoo stretching. <laughs> Okay. okay. Uh, for, for up to 15 minutes, if we want that long, are there any questions or concerns? Is there anything that isn't clear? who we are looking for. Did I get that right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, well, what I don't understand then is, um, is it God's 
manifestation to be blowing people up and to be raping women in Darfur who go to get food for their children. I don't, I don't get that bit. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. I'd be really happy to know your thoughts on that. Yes. This whole mystery of evil. Uh, I'll put it this way. I'm a psychotherapist, psychologist. I work with uh, a lot of, like adult survivors of trauma. And I am myself an adult survivor of childhood trauma abuse. Put it this way, which is the truth of anyone who's known trauma or uh, this, is um, uh, there, there, I don't know what city we're near right now, big city. What's our next biggest city around here? Edinburgh? Edinburgh? Take any city. Any city will do, because it all fits. Any, in cities throughout the world tonight, at this very moment as we speak, is this little moment as we speak, there are little girls being incested by their fathers or stepfathers older, right now as we talk right now, like this tonight. Again, I love the word again. It's happening again. See, little boys being beaten half to death by their own fathers. Again, again, again. And in one sense, clearly, God's not helping a single one of them. If by help we mean stop it from happening, Stop it from happening. If you fell off the back of a boat and everyone's having so much fun, the boat goes off, no one even noticed you fell off. And you're treading water, yelling, waving like this, and you tread water as long as you can. And not being able to tread water any longer, you go under, and your last words are, God, help me. What would probably happen next? Probably you'd drown next. God helps no one. And that, and this, this is the mystery of the cross. The, 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 the mystery of the cross is this very mystery. In the Christian, the Christian tradition, it's right at the center of it all. It puts, puts it right at the centerpiece. Like, look at this one. Take a deep, deep, long look at this one. See? But although God does not help us, God invincibly sustains us in all things, is precious in all that is done to us, and precious in all that we do to each other. God loves the devil as much as God loves the Virgin Mary. See? God loves Hitler as much as God loves Mother Teresa of Calcutta. See? Nothing we can do can make God love us more. Nothing we can do can make God love us less. Because the sole measure of God's love for us is never what we do or say. The sole measure of God's love for us is the infinite expanse of God herself given to us as our life, even in the midst of what we do to each other. But then God depends on us to do our best to stop it. See, see, which, is, which is the essential dimension of justice. And, and the, myst the, the mystic is not less but more committed to the world. The mystic is not less present but more present to the world as doing one's very best to doing what one can to end suffering, to end suffering. So surely, at the existential level, this violence is real. This, all these things are nightmares, they're real. And the only authentic response with, to such a person is to, is to genuinely say, I am so, so sorry, I am genuinely sorry that you had to go through that. Not just what was done to you, but what was done to you, what it did to you. But at the same time to bear witness to that person that there's something in them that's infinitely bigger than all of that. See? No matter how terrible it is, there's something infinitely bigger, infinitely more real than the nightmare. And by opening their heart, they can discover it and heal. Like that. So you're raising a deep question. You know I mean? That's, that's a deep, deep thing. Question really, because oh, I, yeah, um, what I guess what my confusion is is not that not why doesn't God stop it? Because I think I understand that as far as you can. It's is that evil a perfect manifestation of God? Yes and no. Okay. <laughs> it is not a perfect manifestation of God in the clear and obvious and spiritual sense in which it's, it's, the ant it's antithetical to the manifestation of God. It flies in the face of the manifestation of God. And yet, mystically speaking, that too. See? 
manifestation of God. And this is my sense of Michelangelo's. You know the Pieta, Mary holding the dead Christ? <clears throat> and there's this uncanny sense of timeless serenity of the anguish. You know, it's like anguish itself completely permeated with tranquility like this. This too. See? This too. If we, uh, this is in the, in, the, in the resurrection of Christ rising with his wounds. This is the great mystical metaphor of that. It's love's eternal victory over anguish and death. If, if we forget that, we, we, we relevatize the mystery. But if we lean into it in the wrong way, we use spirituality in the service of not facing our suffering and our problems head on. And we, we, we can use our spirituality to dissociate off and remove ourselves from God calling us to, to heal ourselves and others as best we can. Anyone else with anything? Any other lightweight questions? <laughs> Anyone else with anything? Thank you for that question. Is it, you know, for me, any time I struggle with the same stuff, I think about um, just that being brought up in the myth of the Garden of Eden and the apple and the eating of the knowledge of good and evil. And I understand that anything that's a duality isn't the truth. So anytime I'm coming across, you know, the comparison of good and evil, or any comparison that, that I might make, it's not love. And that, that even as a kid, being taught that, that, you know, when Mary stood in the serpent, it wasn't to hurt the poor wee snake, which I was worried about, <laughs> but that, that, it, that love is above making those judgments. And when we're busy looking and having that sense of outrage and injustice that, that we see in the world, the mistake we make is forgetting that love is never a duality. Yeah. Yeah, and just that, although I don't, I can theorise it, you know, it's obviously trying to make that real every time that you feel hurt when you see the hurt, you know? Right. Yes, that's very good, yes. I'd, I'd like to add, add one little, like, nuance to what you said. Yes, that's good that in the knowledge of good and evil, the love is never in the, a duality. And uh, this is why the good and evil, when it's infused with love, you know, it makes repentance possible. Do you know what I mean? That we can let go, acknowledge what happened, and surrender into the love that's always right there. But, and the other side of it is this, that love is never the duality of good and evil, but love is the presence that gives us the courage to, to name evil as evil, and good as good. Do you know what I'm trying to say, really? It's, it's non-judgmental presence to the performer of the evil, invincible, bearing witness to how invincibly lovable they are in the evil thing that they're doing, and inviting them to see that what they're doing is causing suffering to themselves and to others. And uh, it's that paradox, too. That's, for the courage. that's right, there's, that's right, that's right. Yes. Anyone else think we have about five minutes left? Yes. Um, when you say that nothing that we can do or say um, would ever make God make us would make God make us make him love us I don't know if I more that. more or or, or less, less that's more right. or less um, can you I mean everything that you said resonates for me in terms of what I've been studying in the Course in Miracles for the last 12 years you know the I and a lot of the different things in there of you know I am as God created me you know all things are echoes of the voice for God um, this constant coming back that no matter what you think you are, it's not what you are. Mm -hmm. But can you, can you, how do you know that? How do you know that if you haven't had like what Carolyn had as an experience? You know, how do you know it? I mean, it's like, I feel like I want to know it. I want to know it. And I, I, I pray about it. And I, and I want to believe it. And, and I know you're going to tell me, patience, Abigail, patience and faith, and, and yes, but can you say anything else? <laughs> <clears throat> well, this is my, no, this is my sense. No, really, this is very good, this is good. Abby, I think that's you, Abigail. Is that your name? Okay. This is my sense of it, really. I know what you're talking about, because I feel it, too. You know, because that's... And um, 
that sense of, this is my sense of this. Let's say that you and I were talking one-on-one. -on -one. And let's say in talking one-on-one, -on -one, you would tell me about this desire you feel to realize this. You know, you, you, like I said at the beginning, you read or hear these people come to these deep realizations. You want to have that realization, you know, you desire. And in talking about it, I'd ask you to tell me more. You know, tell me more. Like, like when was the first time you ever sensed the desire for that? You know? and, and what do you sense stands in the way of it? And what, you know, it would go like that. It would go like that. It would go like that. My sense would be, as we got into the dialogue together, there would be the sense in which the dialogue itself would be manifesting this. That you're the sincerity of your vulnerability in sharing the desire is itself the manifestation of this. Thomas Merton once said, the very fact you're seeking God means you've already found God, or you wouldn't be seeking God, or better, God's already found you. Uh, I know what you mean by the mystics, and there are experiences like this. They're just these, these life-transforming experiences. But I really do think a lot, and you read Teresa, you read these mystics, a lot of what she's trying to say is to help us get so quiet that we can begin to sense in unconsummated longings, see, the endless holiness of our consummated longings. Does that make sense in a way? That it's not the extravaganza of the more. It's, it's, it's slowing down enough to come upon within ourselves how endlessly holy the unconsummated longings are right at the cutting edge that we're feeling them. That's my sense of it. Okay, should we end here? Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.